This is Thomas Wayne Riley, and you have found yourself in the American Southwest. This is part three of the four-part series on the Dominguez and Escalante Expedition of 1776. If you have not given the previous two a listen, you ought to. Or you may be as lost as our scrappy group who have found themselves in a tough spot with canyons, rocks, and dry hot mesas on the Uncompagre Plateau. But thankfully for them, they just met a Ute man who has agreed to be their guide. So let's catch back up with the crew. To get things started off right with this new guide, the team probably asked him his name, to which he responded with some unpronounceable Ute name, no doubt, to which the crew said, oh, that'll never do. Your name is now Atanasio, which is the same as Dominguez. Lucky him. Roberts, in his Escalante's Dream, which he wrote and of which I have quoted from quite a bit, Roberts calls Atanasio the new team's mascot. And then, to no doubt further confound their newly named guide and friend, hopefully, they asked him a series of questions. Now, whether they expected the man to actually respond, or if they were just asking him these questions to put him at ease, on account of they didn't want to seem like dangerous intruders, which they weren't. But it's unknown why they asked these questions, but they did. The modern reader is only left to guess at why they grilled the new Atanasio in this particular way, but Roberts wrote out a very Daniele Bellelli exchange in his book when the crew are talking to the new Atanasio. And the exchange goes something like this. Escalante. We're worried about Brother Garces. Have you seen him hereabouts or heard any word about what he's up to? Atanasio. No, my friend, not a word, but we'll keep an eye out. Escalante. The last we heard from him, he was hanging out with the Cosninas, and as you know, they are a very dangerous bunch. Atanasio, to himself. In the name of Sinav and all the other gods, who are these Cosninas? I think this fellow wearing his blue blanket is a little crazy, but out loud. Yes, very dangerous. That's why we have nothing to do with them. And now, should we get on our way? End quote. It is true that finding Garces and the Cosninas, or the Havasupai, if you remember, those were secondary goals, but certainly they had to have known they were way too off course to be asking after him and them. So they may have just been putting their new guide at ease. And it seems to have worked. After the questioning and the story time, the Ute man seemed more cool. And then he apologized about the state of the Spaniard's friend, who was lost in the dangerous wilderness, apparently. And then, they were off. When I read Robert's book, he could not explain why on earth the crew had not met a single Indian until this day, 28 days after the start of the expedition. But the more I learned of Rivera, and the more I learned of the expedition, and the more I thought about it, I believe it was definitely a deliberate tactic but one that was slated to fail eventually when this team just continued their march ever northward further into their territory. But now, they were headed directly towards a supposed chief and their encampment. And one encampment in chief friendly to the Spanish. Maybe the youth thought 
It was now time to employ the rotating guide trick. Or as Walter Briggs, in his Without Noise of Arms, wrote, It could have been a play on that part of the man and his family who had, quote, Delayed the expedition to skim choice trade goods before other Utes got their pick? End quote. It could be a combination of all these factors, and then some we don't even know about. Whatever the case, the Padres and the crew probably felt a sense of relief. Even old M and P or Don Bernardo Miera y Pacheco. After the exchange and the questioning, the man's family set off for their home with the goods that the men promised not to trade with, but had just done that very thing. Again, though, I do think at least it wasn't for personal gain. But it was now just this new guide, Atanasio, and our ten men, plus two, that made up the D&E crew, and they were about to set off through their own dangerous wilderness towards an Indian tribe, much like Gar says. They passed stately trees of aspen, spruce, ponderosa pine, and Douglas fir. But the not-so-attentive-to-nature Escalante only mentioned a tree that was translated as cottonwood, or has been translated as cottonwood. They were passing through a land carved deeply and violently by the glaciers of the Pleistocene, those glaciers I talked in depth about so many episodes ago when I covered the Ice Age in the New World. He does mention the animals that he saw in the area, of which there were plenty. Stags, deer, and some fowls with quote-unquote savory flesh. And these would probably have been grouse, which are fast, tricky little birds who, upon being forced to fly, only go about four feet into the air before slowly coming down and hiding some 30 feet away, which makes them very tricky to shoot with a shotgun. I would know. I go hunting for them for a weekend every October in northern Wisconsin. I have emptied many a barrel of my double-barreled shotgun into the foliage and trees of those Northwoods to no avail. Briggs points out that shotguns weren't even invented yet, so hunting them must have been quite the challenge. Maybe they trapped them? I'd like to ask my old-timer grouse friends what they think about that method. Before dinner that evening, they were soaked to the bone by a storm. So no fire. And even in August, they were probably shivering cold. Because at this point, in these valleys, it was one of the highest points they'd come across so far. On the 26th, they came to the modern-day Uncompagre River, but a river they called the San Francisco. Although, Escalante said the guide called the river, quote, Encompagre, which, according to the interpreter, means Laguna, Colorado, because near its source there is a spring of red water, hot and tasting bad. Obviously, we got today's Encompagre from the Ute Encompagre, and Laguna, Colorado means red lake. Uh, That night, they camped in a swamp, near the river and near the modern town of Montrose. They then crossed the river the following day, before running into another Ute Indian. I guess when it rains, it pours. This man's name was El Zerdo, which is the left-handed. And it is somewhat implied that he was known amongst some of the crew, but we don't know who knew him. That part wasn't recorded, of course. That would have been kind of interesting. But the powwow wasn't all that informative in the end. And Escalante wrote, quote, We tarried a good while with him, and after a lengthy conversation drew forth nothing more useful than that we had suffered from the heat, which was indeed very fiery. End quote. Briggs chastises the Padre here for his quip at learning nothing useful in the chat when he wrote, quote, Nothing useful. In his diary tomorrow, Escalante would note that yesterday we learned of Sabuagana rancherias nearby, and that in them were some of the Timpanagotsi, or Laguna Indians. And two days hence, he would write that, quote, The Utes told us that the Lagunas lived in pueblos, like those of New Mexico, end quote. 
This intelligence, coming in dribbles, was portentous. End all quotes. So a band of Utes that live on a lake and in pueblos, like the Lake of Copala. Were these Timpanagotzi or Laguna Utes living on the banks of Tehuayo? Before we get into that, who exactly are the Ute Indians I keep mentioning? We've talked a lot about the Puebloans, the Hopis, a little about the Navajos and Apaches, but I've never really talked about the Utes in any previous episode prior to this series. Let's learn a little about their past and how they fit into the wider world of the American Southwest. The Ute belong to the language family of the Udo Aztecan. So the same language family as the Aztecs. And the same language family as their sometimes enemy, the Peaceful Ones, or the Hopi. Although, the two languages are not mutually intelligible. Well, I guess three languages are not mutually intelligible. The Utes speak the Shoshone branch of Udo Aztecan. They're believed to originally been from the California-Nevada border area of Death Valley. By about 1000 AD, the ancestral Utes had left their homelands of the Great Basin region and were fanning out into more eastern Utah and western Colorado. The Comanches would break off from the Shoshones, the Shoshone-speaking Ute Aztecan, and the Comanches would continue down the front range. By 1300, the southern Utes were firmly established hunter-gatherers, inhabiting the lands recently abandoned by the ancestral Puebloans and the Chaco Aztec and Anasazi in southern Colorado and Utah. And we know all about them from previous episodes, hopefully. A little to the north of that southern Colorado area, they would have inhabited the lands at the Fremont, or the northern Anasazi, although it's not quite correct terminology there, but the Fremont Indians. That land they had established as their own. And the Fremont are still somewhat of a mystery to me, and and one of these days I will indeed do an episode over them. Probably right after my addendum to the Anasazi episode. The Utes would go as far east as Oklahoma and Texas to hunt for bison and to trade with their cousins and neighbors. It seems most Indians of the region consider the area around Pikes Peak, towards the southern end of the Front Range in Colorado. Most Indians seem to consider that area to be the Ute Domain. And the Utes even named that massive mountain, Pikes Peak, Tavakiev, which meant Sun Mountain. And not far from there, close to the border of New Mexico, Just east of the Sangre Cristo Mountains sits two of my favorite mountains in the American Southwest. They're known as the Spanish Peaks today, but the Utes, they named them Breasts of the Earth, for reasons that become fantastically clear upon their viewing. Over in Utah, in Arches National Park, there are petroglyphs at the start of the trail up to the famous Delicate Arch. And those petroglyphs are worth the short detour if you ever find yourself there, which everyone should. The Utes, on this big old boulder, carved men hunting on horseback. And these petroglyphs sit next to even older Anasazi and Fremont petroglyphs. It's a pretty cool spot. And although that place is extremely popular, not many people just take the very short detour near the old cabin to see the petroglyphs. They're so blinded by that license plate staple, which is very pretty. So, despite Escalante's comments about not learning much from El Zerdo, they did indeed learn about the Laguna Utes who live on their lake. Obviously, we will be returning to them shortly. I mean, hence the name of the episode. On the 28th of August, the d expedition reached the Gunnison River, which they called the San Javier, and which the Utes called Tomichi. I have not been to this portion of the Gunnison River, which they are about to cross, but I have been to the portion upstream known as the Black Canyon of the Gunnison. And let me tell you, 
It is impossibly impressive and absolutely gorgeous. I went in July some years ago with my Basque friend, and it was incredibly just awe-inspiring, and it's, it's deep. I can't imagine what the Padres would have thought if they'd come to the edge of that dark, deep gorge in the mountains instead of downstream where they did. At its highest, the cliffs of the Black Canyon plunge 2,722 feet down to the river. It was on the banks of this river, this Gunnison River, that they called San Javier. It was on the banks of this river that it was decided they were going to take a small, quote-unquote, detour instead of continuing on towards Monterey. They needed to, according to the eager Padres, but they needed to go check in on the Sabuaganas, despite the fact that it would, quote, consume many supplies, end quote. I wonder how Maria y Pacheco felt about this detour. I imagine his main and only goal was reaching California and creating his map. This detour and further detours were probably felt as unnecessary and foolish by the wise old man. We can't know his reaction, though, because Escalante did not record it. To save some time, d e sent Andres Muñez with Atanasio, who is the Sabuana Ute. They sent Muñez and Atanasio on ahead to see if any of the Sabs or the Lagunas, or really just any Ute, would mind being paid to show them the rest of the way. They still really needed a guide. And maybe Atanasio was feeling homesick for his family by now. The next morning, after they had camped on the banks of the Gunnison, the next morning the camp is quite surprised when five Indians show up on some hill nearby screaming their lungs out. After changing their pants, probably, the Padres regain some peace and coax these five Indians down from the hills. At first, they assumed they were the ones that were sent for by Andres Muñez and Atanasio. But they soon realized that no, these are just some five other Utes who were in the area. Might they have been sent to deter them? After offering the proverbial peace pipe in the form of tobacco, which seems to usually work, remember when Escalante did this same move in Hopi with this, with his Havasu friend? But after this time, after offering the tobacco, they then somehow talk with these five Utes? How on earth they communicated with them is a mystery. Maybe sign language? Maybe with one of the stowaways, Philippe or Juan Domingo? Maybe they spoke Navajo and Juan Pedro Cisneros was able to speak with him. What then did they learn in this communication? Well, according to Escalante, not much. Except that they'd had a lot of trouble with their Comanche cousins this past summer. Escalante wasn't buying it, though. No doubt he had a copy of Rivera's journal in his pack, and he'd read how they threw him off the trail with constant fear of Comanche and Indian attacks, and that had been 11 years prior. It seems the Utes were forging ahead with that same campaign against d e From Escalante. We could not draw out of them anything useful for our plan because theirs was to fill us with fear by exaggerating the danger to which we were exposing ourselves of being killed by the Comanches if we continued on our course. We refuted the validity of these pretenses, by which they were trying to stop us from going ahead, by telling them that our God, who is everyone's, would defend us if we should happen to run into these foes. End quote. His Armor of Faith and his armor of historical knowledge with Rivera's journal. They were both protecting him from being turned around, it seems. The Padres are going to win this round. It is curious, though, that they were using the Comanches as the scare tactic, because Comanches in northwestern Colorado? Maybe the Utes knew that the Comanches were the enemies of the Spanish. Or maybe the Utes ran into them while hunting in the Buffalo Kingdom. 
by now. In the 1770s, the Comanches and their empire of the summer moon was very powerful and lethal. And the Puebloans and the Spanish lived in near constant fear of their attacks. I talked about in the opening episode how MMP had fought in a campaign against them. And you'll hear in the final episode, at the end, how he would fight in another campaign later in life. That later campaign would finally see the beginning of the end for the mighty Comanche, the enemy of everyone. As that Comanche card player says in the movie Hell or High Water. In reality, though, the word Comanche itself may be a Ute word. And that word means enemy. Or stranger. It seems in the Southwest, many tribal names are the name their enemies have bestowed upon them. I think that might be true actually for the whole world. Some American Indians wear this name proudly. Others are more sensitive. Me personally, I would wear it pretty proudly. The actual story goes, though, that in July of 1706, a Spanish sergeant major named Juan de Ulibarri witnessed the Utes and the Comanches preparing to attack Taos Pueblo. So this is 70 years before our current story. And this was the first time that they had ever been recorded in history. S. C. Gwen, in the hotly debated Empire of the Summer Moon, says this of that event. Quote, He later heard of actual Comanche attacks, he being Juan de Ulipari. This was the first the Spanish or any white man had heard of these Indians who had many names. One name in particular, given to them by the Utes, was Comats, sometimes given as Comancia, and meant anyone who was against me all the time. The authorities in New Mexico translated this various ways, but eventually as Comanche, end quote. And more on the Comanche in a bit. Because there's a good chance it is not just a threat that they were using, but the Comanches may actually have been there. Actually, I believe that they were. The following day, the 30th of August, Andres Munez and Atanasio return with five more Sabs and one Laguna Ute. And I keep saying Sabs instead of Saboganas, because... They offered these, the crew, offered these new arrivals plenty of food and obviously some tobacco. And then they asked for a guide to the Laguna Pueblo. But that Laguna who had come with them said that while he was indeed a Laguna, he was in fact not those Lagunas. And actually, he didn't know the way to his own homeland anyways, actually. I just remembered. I don't know where I live. The conversation went something like, I am a Laguna Indian. Oh, that's great. Can you take us to your homeland? Well, you see, while I am a Laguna, I'm not that Laguna. And besides, I don't remember. And there are Comanches over this hill. And the next hill. And we should turn back from here. Here's what Escalante wrote, with a hint of frustration. They replied that to go to the place we were trying to reach, there was no other trail than one passing through the midst of the Comanches, and that these would impede our passage and even deprive us of our lives, and finally, that none of them knew the country between here and the Lagunas. This they repeated many times, insisting that we had to turn back from here. We tried to convince them, first by arguing, and then by cajoling, so as not to displease them. Then we showed the Laguna a woolen blanket, a big all-purpose knife, and white glass beads, telling him this is what we were giving him so that he would accompany us and serve us as a guide all the way to his country. He agreed, and the things mentioned were turned over to him. When the Saboranas saw this, they quit posing difficulties and now acknowledged that some of them knew the way. End quote. Man, that is a sweet knife. I, I suddenly remember the way home now. But would you want to come over to our house first? D and E, apparently knew the ruse of inviting them over to their rancheria and how it was used to, quote, detain us and longer enjoy the kindness we were doing them, for to as many as came there, and today there were plenty, we gave them to eat and to smoke, end quote. But seeing as how they didn't want to be rude and they didn't want to lose this invaluable guide, they agreed to head on over to 
to this Sabuarana Ute's house. From this camp, they'd cross the Gunnison River, head through some terrain of prickly pear, lava rocks, and hills, and camp for the evening with their new Sabuarana and the Laguna friends. The next day, after crossing two rivers, they began to eat a lunch or maybe dinner, but one of the Sabuagana friends got a little too excited and, quote, ate with such brutish savagery that we thought he was going to die from overstuffing. On finding himself so sick, he claimed that the Spaniards had done him harm. This stupid notion caused us a great deal of worry, for we already knew that these, pardon his language, barbarians, when they happen to get sick after having eaten what someone else gives them, even if he be from among their own, believe that he damaged them and tried to avenge an injury which they never received. End quote. So this poor guy ate so much of the Spaniard's food that he was sick with a food baby. Briggs writes of this notion of injury from ingestion uh, seriously, and how 76 years later, something somewhat similar happened with the U.S. Army and the Utes. He writes, quote, Escalante knew something of what he was talking about. Seventy-six years later, a U.S. Indian agent in Santa Fe would report the following incident. A Ute war captain had a beautiful wife who took sick. A medicine man was called in. Either the disease or the medicine was the death of the woman. The war captain paid off the doctor bill by putting a bullet through the medicine man, leaving another vacancy in the medical department among the Utahs. End all quotes. Thankfully for the D&E crew, quote, God willed that he recovered after he vomited some of the great mass he could not digest. End quote. I can't help but hear the sarcasm pouring from the words of the journal. At this point, they finally stop heading east, because remember Monterey is on the west coast. So they stop heading east, and they would not do so again until crossing into Arizona from Utah in a few months. Spoiler alert. They were, though, getting precariously far from their target of Monterey. I believe some in the group were beginning to sense it, especially Miera y Pacheco. This current Ute guide, though, just like they'd renamed the previous guide, they also renamed him no doubt on account of his name again being somewhat difficult to pronounce for the Spanish, who were notoriously unwilling to learn local languages. They named this new guide Silvestre, after Escalante himself. So they now had two Silvestres and two Atanasios. Although I don't think we ever hear from the second Atanasio again. He kind of just disappears from the journal. They traveled for two more days after the vomiting incident through more forests of aspen and spruce and through large grassy parks flattened by those glaciers. They were yet again at one of their highest elevations amongst the beautiful streams, which that elevation is around 8,600 feet. And it was here that they ran into an army of around 80 Utes on horseback. Escalante writes of the tense situation, quote, They told us that they were going to out to hunt, but we figured that they came together like this, either to show off their strength in numbers or to find out if any other Spanish people were coming behind us or if we came alone. End quote. I have no doubt that Escalante's guess about them trying to discover what the Spanish numbers and intentions were was correct. And I have no doubt that for a moment, each member of the team may have felt like this was their last moment on God's green earth. Maybe M&P went for the rifle, but was held back. God will protect us, Dominguez or Escalante may have muttered. Escalante also guessed that they were all from the village that they were the expedition was heading towards, which is why Every available warrior, man, rode out to see what was up. 
Eventually, the men on horseback leave, and they continue to follow Silvestre and Laguna for three more miles. Almost as if to avoid the drama the overwhelming warriors must have caused the crew, Escalante records after the incident that so far in the 35 days they'd been out, they had traveled 199 leagues, or 523 miles. That's quite impressive, if you ask me. It was by now, September 1st. At this point, they were at the grand encampment of the Sabuaganas, which had about 30 tents and was numerous with people. These tents, or teepees, were a newer addition to the Utes. They were acquired from the Plains Indians after the Utes gained the horse. The horse, you see, was able to carry these heavy tents and allow the Ute people to gather more food from around the area, which in turn had enlarged their groups from 20 or so Utes to the large number that the DNA expedition would run into. A lot had changed since the time of the Anasazi Alta pedal in the Four Corners, and a lot of that change was due to the arrival of the horse back on its native soil after a separation of 10 millennia. The group respectfully camped a mile south of the Utes, but immediately upon setting up camp, Dominguez, Andres Munez, and Silvestre de Laguna entered the village and headed for the teepee of the quote-unquote chieftain. Inside, Dominguez embraced the chief and his sons and then asked if he could please assemble all of his people. He had a message of utmost importance for them. That message was... The Gospel. Through the interpreter, maybe both Munez and Silvestre, not sure, but through an interpreter, he told the gathered Sabuajanas all about God and Christianity, and according to the journal, the people believed him. But then, a hard-of-hearing older man asked, what was all this then? To which the Laguna Silvestre replied that, Dominguez was telling them the truth about the Lord and the heavens and baptism. Maybe they'd been preaching to this Laguna Ute since he joined the crew, and he was already converted, and now he was helping Dominguez spread the word among his own people. Dominguez would next ask another Laguna that was present, a man who was helping his fellow Utes in the understanding of the gospel. Dominguez would ask him what his name was, to which this Laguna would reply, Oh, so Colorado. Red Bear, oh, obviously he would reply in Ute, and then it was translated into Oh, so Colorado, which means Red Bear, which is an awesome name. Or at least I thought. Dominguez thought otherwise. And immediately he gave a lesson on how men are superior to beasts. So one should not name oneself after an animal. So he's going to need a new Christian name. And what better name than the one he himself had? So Francisco Dominguez named this red bear Francisco. Despite this sermon on conflating man and beast, Briggs points out that, quote, Yet Spaniards themselves stood proud of such names as Leon, lion, and Cabeza de Vaca, cow's head, end quote. I've talked about Cabeza de Vaca a couple times now but that is a very astute observation by Briggs. After he renamed him Francisco, the rest of the Ute band in attendance apparently attempted to repeat this new name, although with quote-unquote some difficulty. Dominguez also then asked if they wanted to further learn about the truth, and if so, he would return in a year to build a mission and to baptize the lot of them, to which they replied with the... Uh, We'll see. I can't help but wonder what was really going through the people's minds when they were hearing of Jesus and seeing the cross and crucifixion. There is a solid chance the people truly and readily accepted this and believed he was the one true way to heaven, which would have been a totally new concept to them, both one heaven and a way to get there. All of, all of that is true. It would have been totally new and foreign. There's also a solid chance they were just sitting through these lessons like a teenager does in church. They're there because they have to be, and they're polite. Maybe they'd heard from other Indians of this 
practice that the Spanish do, and they were told it's best to just let them talk, and then they'll be on their way. I have no idea. Then again, Christianity is the largest religion on the planet, with one-third of humans counting themselves as such. After some more preaching, of course, they then sat down and had a big Thanksgiving-esque meal of jerked bison, which Dominguez had bought with some glass beads. I love me some beef jerky, especially the bark kind that's super dry, and I love me some bison. I mean, I eat it twice a week. But I have somehow never had great bison jerky. If any listener knows of a farm or a group that makes some good bison jerky, please let me know. After Dominguez asked them, the Utes also agreed to trade some lame horses for some fresh ones. The trade in the meeting was set for later that evening. But the meeting wouldn't go quite as planned. Even before that, though, we learn of some treachery amongst our own group. Remember, if you will, because some of the men of the expedition certainly had not remembered, but remember when it was promised that no trading for personal gain was to occur on this expedition? Well, it was found out that evening that some of the men had hidden things, probably beads and knives, Things small enough to remain hidden this whole time in their packs and sacks. But some of the men had broken their word, and it was found out that they had indeed traded with the Indians for personal gain. I mean, it was practically their only rule before leaving. But it was a tough rule to follow, apparently. And this trading infuriated the Padres, who then accused the men of mutiny. One of the disobedient was the interpreter, Andres Munoz. Another was his brother. And the third was Philippe, who was one of the two young men that showed up 15 days after the expedition had started. And that boy, remember, is what's known as a Hinizaro. Actually, all three of the men may have been Hinizaros or mixed-blood Indians, and Philippe had escaped a Pueblo ranch. So they would probably have more knowledge of the road ahead than the Spaniards, especially Philippe. I've talked about the knowledge of the Munez brothers, although I still go back and forth on what they actually knew and how helpful they were. And I, even having written this entire series, I still go back and forth. It is possible that the road ahead and the threat of Comanches scared them. Or it's possible they just wanted to stay with these people that they were familiar with. And I say that because it appears, and Escalante certainly writes about this, but it appears that these three traded with the Indians so that uh, that captain, the chief, and his Sabogana men would persuade the Spaniards to turn around. And this trade is believed by Escalante because when the chief, captain, some very old men of the tribe, and some of the younger Sabuganas showed up before sundown, they began anew their pleading for the Spanish to turn around. And this kind of makes me think maybe Rivera's expedition was plagued by some of the same things. But Escalante wrote, They began trying to persuade us to turn back from here exaggerating anew and with greater effort the hardships and perils to which we were exposing ourselves by going ahead, saying for certain that the Comanches would not let us do so, and that they did not tell us this to stop us from going as far as we wanted, but because they esteemed us highly. We acknowledged this token and told them that the one God, whom we worshipped, would expedite everything for us, and would defend us, not only from the Comanches, but also from all others who might intend to do us harm and that we fear not a thing that they were bringing up because we were certain that his majesty was on our side. End quote. Again, with that strong armor of faith. But I do think it's more than that. I believe they were also aware of the ruse and reason behind the attempts that the Indians were making to turn the Spaniards around. But the Spaniards weren't budging. So, 
The Utes turned up the heat and said, Okay, if you're not going to turn around, then could you please write a letter to your great chief, a.k.a. the king in Spain, and could you tell him that you merely passed through these lands and you didn't stay here? Because if you end up dead, we don't want the Spanish thinking it was us, okay? It was not the Sabuagana Utes. Dominguez and Escalante weren't buying that either. And Escalante wrote in the journal that this tactic was, quote, a ruse from among some of our own companions who wanted to turn back or loiter among them, end quote. So they knew the trading had taken place, and it seems it had been to ask the Indians to convince them to stay. And D&E responded to the captain, though, and they tell him that, sure, we'll write a letter and we'll leave it with you so that the next time one of you goes to New Mexico, you can take it along and hand it over to the governor. But that was not good enough. Or at least, the Sabuaganas feared that would not be good enough. So they asked D&E if one of them could please take it. To which d responded that no, we cannot take it because no one can leave our party. We're all going together to California. Escalante writes this of the end of the exchange. Finally, now that they found no other way to hinder our passage without declaring themselves our enemies, they said that if we did not turn back from here, they would not make exchanges for the hoof-sore horses we had. To this we replied that we would go on even if they made no exchange, because under no circumstances would we turn back without knowing the whereabouts of the Padre, our brother. End quote. Wait, what now? Again with Father Garces? I mean, it is possible that they were using his unknown whereabouts and his story and his wandering with the Costinas. It's possible they were using that as a disarming tactic. Essentially saying that we're not here to conquer. We're just here to find our silly, wandering friend. And once we do, we'll be on our way. But until then, we're going. Well, after this exchange, the Indians realized they weren't going to stop these Spaniards. So they gave in and said, Look, we're only telling you all this and trying to stop you because we love you. And you're our friends. And then they said, In the morning, we'll exchange our horses with you. No problem. In reality... The Padres had discovered the, the previous day, right before entering the camp, they discovered that then that these three men had snuck personal belongings along with them to trade. And before they even entered the camp of the Sobs, they were reminding them that trading for personal gain was forbidden and God was on their side so they didn't need no weapons or anything like that. But again, the Munez brothers and Philippe the Henizaro weren't interested in going further than this spot, apparently. And that's partly because they believed this spot was the furthest that any Spaniard had ever been north. And they preferred to stay right here with Thebes, thank you very much. Or at least to turn back around. You know, is this the furthest any Spaniard had gotten? Or did Rivera make it to Moab? Which I believe he did, after finding those those later letters that I read in uh, one of the last two episodes. I'm not sure. The next morning, everyone that had spoken with them the evening before, and even more this time, uh, they came to the king's camp. And the king's camp is what the the Spanish called their camp whenever they were amongst the American Indians, because they were representatives of the king in Spain. So the next morning, even more Sabuaganas showed up, and they began yet again to persuade these men to turn around. Sometime during the night, though, they had gotten to their Laguna guide, Silvestre, and that morning their guide gave back the things which the Spanish had traded with him so that he may take the Spanish to his lakeside pueblo. Which, again, that lakeside pueblo may have been Tehuayo. After an hour and a half, though, the Spaniards said, All right, enough. We're going whether we have a guide or not. But know that if we go... Y'all are no longer our friends, and we will tell the governor and the king that news. But y'all ain't stopping us, and we best be leaving now. This worked, and after Dominguez had said it, one of Captain's brothers got up and said something to the effect of, quote, Since they had granted us passage, and the Laguna had agreed to guide us, placing obstacles before us was no longer appropriate, and that they should therefore stop talking about this matter. End. Essentially, 
Ah, the game is up. We lost. It's time to send them on their way. The playbook that worked with Rivera, it's failed us. After this heated exchange, the entire Sabuagani Ute encampment had packed up, and by the time the Spanish were saddled and ready to head out, they were gone. That whole encampment just vanished. They weren't messing around. But because of the whole ordeal and the going back and forth, their guide, the Laguna Ute Silvestre, didn't want to guide them any longer. And he decided to just stay at the spot where the old encampment was. I can picture him, as if it were a movie almost. Silvestre centered in the frame, sitting in the dust, with the Utes on horseback going one way, and the Spanish on horseback going the other. You can hear the sound of the hoofs and the neighing, and the people talking, and he's the dust is settling, and it's getting quieter, and Sylvester is just sitting there, dejected and confused as the world moves on around him. In reality, at, the, at that time, he claimed he was looking for a saddle, but that was just an excuse. Well, d e sent Andres Munez back there to get him and comfort him and convince him to come along. Please. Which eventually... He did. And thankfully, he did. Because again, our adventurers, they have no idea where they are or where they're going. But now, on September 2nd, they were finally heading off again to the west, albeit the northwest. So, continually, even further north than Monterey. But at least they had a guide. And while Monterey was still on their mind, another goal of the expedition came to the forefront. And they might, just might, be heading to the Lake of Copala, the land of Tehuayo. But first, they had to travel through Comancheria. But isn't Comancheria on the Great Plains? What are we to make of this Comanche threat all the way up in northwest Colorado and northeast Utah? Roberts isn't convinced the Comanche are there at all, and it is indeed a ruse. He sought a 2008 book by an author, I shall not name because I had also planned on using this author as a source, when their brand new book came out recently. I excited, I think I talked about this actually in the Pueblo Revolt episode. But I excitedly picked up this book the day that it came out, only to find two flat-out incorrect pieces of information in what little I read of the enormous book. I returned it. Because how can a book claiming to be a definitive history of the Indians of North America, which is, yes, a grandiose task in and of itself, but how can someone make two errors in the only two passages of the book that I read? Recently, on Twitter, I saw somebody had read the book that I returned and also said there were Many factual errors in it, and I commented saying pretty much the story I just told you. And it was a rather famous history um, blogger, I guess. And they agreed. So, unfortunately, Roberts uses this author, although it's a different book about the Comanche. And in that book that Roberts uses as a source for Comanche homeland, he says that the author makes a map of that area, the area of Comancheria, the, the area that the, the Empire of the Summer Moon, essentially. And that map has the area being the Southern Great Plains, but there's also a spot on that map right here on the Colorado-Utah-Wyoming border where the DNA expedition was being warned to avoid. So Roberts dug deeper and he found that this author's only source for the Comanche homeland, like the Comanche homeland being in this one spot on the Utah, Wyoming, Colorado border, the only resource was the very journal I am going through right now with y'all. The Dominguez Nescalante Expedition Journal. His only citations were this journal and the maps that M&P will make afterwards. So Roberts isn't sure of what to make of the claim. And since he was writing a book on Dominguez and Escalante, he dug no further. And I don't blame him. Although he does come up with a clever way to suggest they were just another distant branch of Shoshone Utes, which could be, but 
I mean, the Shoshone Utes and the Comanche are kind of cousins anyways. Briggs, though, in his Without Noise of Arms, writes that the Comanche once lived beyond the Yellowstone River, but eventually left for the Buffalo Kingdom of the Great Plains because it better suited their lifestyle. Either that or Crows and Blackfeet drove them out. Crows and Blackfeet Indian. That second possibility, though, doesn't quite add up to the Comanche of historical record. That historical record tells us that the Comanche may have been one of the first northern tribes to acquire, via the Utes, actually, which is strange because these southern Utes that we'll see don't have the horse, but they may have acquired the horse via the Utes. And then once the Comanche had fanned out of the Great Basin region, along with the others from that area, once they gained the horse, they used it alarmingly well. In S.C. Gwen's Empire of the Summer Moon, which again is a hotly debated but incredibly enjoyable read, well, in Empire of the Summer Moon, Gwen suggests that the Comanche were the only Plains tribe to successfully breed horses. The other tribes just raided for them. He also claims that the Comanche were the only ones to do battle entirely on horseback. Everyone else, including the Apache, rode to the battle, dismounted, and then fought. This is actually believed to be the reason the steppe people of Eurasia were so effective at the horse as well, if you've ever listened to Dan Garland. And Gwyn also makes that comparison, S.C. Gwyn. The Comanche lived on their horse. They were also seemingly supplied with firearms by trading with the French, so they were armed and on horseback. But even without firearms, they could shoot 20 arrows from the back of a horse while it took a soldier to load and shoot one rifle shot. Allegedly. Either way, they were impressive and feared. I will talk about them again at the end when Don Maria Pacheco goes and fights the toughest leader the Comanche ever had, Greenhorn. Herbert Bolton, the first Anglo to write about the DNA expedition, if you'll remember, um, Bolton quoted from a Spanish Indian agent of French descent named Athanasi de Mezieres who in 1770 wrote about the Comanche, quote, They are a people so numerous and haughty that when asked their number, they make no difficulty of comparing it to that of the stars. They are so skillful in horsemanship that they have no equal, so daring that they never ask for or grant truces, and in the possession of such a territory that, finding it in an abundance of pasturage for their horses and an incredible number of buffalo, which to furnish them, all the raiment, food, and shelter, they only just fall short of possessing all the conveniences of the earth. End quote. Mieta y Pacheco, the expedition's gallant map maker and heroic old soldier, once wrote in two different legends on two of his maps about the Comanche. And very helpfully, the author Briggs has made a composite of those writings that Mieta y Pacheco put on his maps. Quote, this nation is very warlike and cruel. They say they left the region farther north, breaking through various nations. They obtained horses and iron weapons, and they have acquired so much skill in handling both that they excel all nations in their dexterity and hardiness. They have made themselves the lords and masters of all the buffalo country to the province of Texas, taking it from the Apache Nation, which was formerly the most widely extended of all known in America. They have destroyed many of the Apache Nations, pushing those that were left to the frontiers of our king's provinces. The Comanches and Apaches have brought about such panic that they have left no towns, cities, or ranchos of Spaniards unattacked. End quote. That's, that's impressive. The Comanches' raiding was legendary. And it would continue to be so well into the 19th century, as they fought eventually with the Mexicans, and then the Americans. The Mexicans would actually invite the Anglo-Texans to their territory in part as a buffer against these raids. And part of the creation of the Texas Rangers was to pursue and make war with the Comanches. In 
the Utes obviously had great fear of them as well. Despite both speaking a Shoshone branch of Udo Aztecan and being distant cousins. So, who were these phantom Comanche warriors terrorizing the Laguna and Sabogana Utes during this time? The question remains unanswered, but I'm willing to bet it was indeed the Comanche. They probably rode into the area when they wanted to via Wyoming from the Great Plains. So numerous as to compare their number to the stars. So quick on horseback that they could escape armies and Indians easily, and at will. Unequaled at making war in the Americas until our own American empire. I would not put it past the empire of the summer moon to be raiding their old neighbors up north in the summer when the Buffalo Kingdom gets unbearably hot. It just so happens that by September, these Comanche had left and had returned back south to join their brethren, where the winters were easier than the northern Rockies, although still tough. I believe it was probably the Comanche who the Utes keep referencing. Before our expedition left the old camp of the long-gone Sabuaganas, I must inform you that the expedition also picked up another Laguna Ute Ute. Ute Youth. Ute Youth. A youthful Ute. Uh, the blacksmith, Joaquin Lain, put this Laguna Ute Youth man on the back of his own saddle. So he must have been pretty young. A young man. Because of this young Indian riding hind saddle with Joaquin, they named him Joaquin. So as they left for the Laguna's homeland, they had yet another guide, albeit a young one. That means the crew now consisted of the original ten, the two add-ons they picked up in the beginning, and I'm going to say the two Laguna Utes, only because I don't think we ever hear from the Sabuagana Atanasio again. He probably went back with his own people uh, as they went the other way. The next leg of their journey takes place in lands that are mostly unknown to me personally, but they consist of meadows and forests in the over 10,000 foot elevated Grand Mesa. It would rain heavily on them there. They also encountered no Comanche, but they did encounter some Ute women who gave them some sweet and sour gooseberries that had been drying in the sun after they'd picked them. They would, at this point, reach the true highest point of their journey on that 10,000-foot Grand Mesa, and there they would really feel the cold. They'd come across beaver dams and lands which Escalante was not overly impressed with, but which I am sure are absolutely gorgeous to the rest of us. He wrote of creeks and streams that would disappear into the earth only to reappear downstream somewhere. During these next few days, he also learned from the guide how much they'd gone out of the way on their detour to the Sabuagana camp. And this detour surely ate through their food supply, but it definitely ate through their supply of time. The days by now were getting shorter, the chill must have been getting stronger. In the end, it wouldn't matter because all this wasted time only contributed to saving their lives, as you'll see. Finally, after four days of traveling, on September 5th, which marks the 39th day of the journey, and which said journey had taken them roughly 573 miles so far, on that fourth day of travel, our group made it to a river that the Utes called the Rio Colorado. Except they called it that in their own language. The Spanish, however, called this river the San Rafael River. So, what river was it? Well, it was the Colorado River. The one and the same that forms the Grand Canyon. The same river Garces was exploring in that very moment, just way downstream. Very, very far away. This was the Rio Tizon. This was the river that they were looking for, that they were hoping to cross and explore for both majesties. Except, our intrepid explorers had no idea that it was one and the same. And they crossed it easily and without much fanfare. As a matter of fact, 
Escalante wrote that they weren't even very impressed by the river. And they wouldn't see the Rio Colorado again until their dramatic and nearly genocidal run-in with it near modern-day Lee's Ferry during the most dramatic events of the expedition. They'd certainly be impressed with it then, but that's for next episode. Briggs does write this of the Rio and our explorer's crossing of it. The next year, when Maria began drawing maps of the route, he would have figured it out. His San Rafael became for a stretch the Rio de los Cebuaranas with the Dolores and Navajo, or San Juan, as tributaries, and then the mighty Rio Colorado. End quote. On the 6th, they left that mighty river and continued towards modern-day Dinosaur National Monument and the Green River. It seems they were back on their journey to California. But you never know with these guys. This part of the West is a place I have not yet explored, although I have tried on three separate occasions to go to Dinosaur National Monument. Uh, But I wanted to camp, see the fossils, and do the Echo Park Drive from Utah to Colorado. But all three times I went, it was early spring and weather turned me around. One day, I will. The next four days for the crew seemed to be pretty unpleasant, as Silvestre, the ute, led them through some rough terrain, including a spot so thin on the trail, Escalante was afraid that the horses were going to fall down and slip and slide all the way to the bottom of this cliff they were traveling on. It was also during these days when they learned from the Munez brothers and Philippe, their stowaway, that Silvestre, their guide, may have been leading them on a wild goose chase. Escalante writes, quote, The companions conversant with the Utah language tried to convince us that Silvestre, the guide, was leading us by that route either to keep us winding about so as not to proceed further, or to hand us over to a Sabuagana ambuscade that could be awaiting us. To make the guide more suspect to us, they assured us of their having heard many Sabuaganas at the encampment telling him to lead us on the trail which went to the lake and, after having kept us needlessly winding around for eight or ten days, to make us turn back. And even though it was not altogether incredible that some could have said this, we never believed that the guide had agreed to it, nor even that it had actually happened, because not one of these companions of ours had told us anything like it up to here. The fact being that, while at the encampment, they did not cease magnifying other less fearsome difficulties, and more likely ones, and that in any ill event, they risked only a bit less than we did. End quote. So the guides were suggesting that their other guides were pulling a Rivera on them, huh? But D and E weren't buying it, and they weren't hearing any more on the subject. So they continued to head northwest through the Comanche Territory and towards the banks of the Laguna Utes Lake. And then, that evening, to vindicate the Padres, they camped next to a Sabuagana Ute encampment filled with men that had been up northwest that very day in the very direction they were traveling in order so that they could steal some horses from the Comanche. But unfortunately for them, although fortunately for our group, the Comanches were no longer there. These Sabuaganas deduced that, quote, from tracks in the sand, the Comanches must have moved out to the east, headed toward El Rio de Napaste, end quote. El Rio de Napaste, Napaste is the modern-day Arkansas River. Wait a minute. The Arkansas River? The headwaters to that river are 120 miles straight through mountains towards the east. Although if they went up and around the mountains, they'd avoid that tough hike. And avoiding that would be easier to do on horses, which the Comanche must have had. And doesn't the Arkansas River travel straight through Comancheria and the Buffalo Kingdom? I'm starting to believe it may have been the Comanches after all. I mean, I already believed it, but now I really believe it. The Comanche would carry so many horses that they could just never cease riding. That's how they escaped so many armies, especially the U.S. Army later. The men of our expedition, though, d and men, they continued through the land northwesterly, always on the lookout for these phantom Comanches, but thankfully, they'd never see them. They'd also never see another Sabuagana Ute after that evening. They were now on the lookout for these Laguna Utes, or Lake Utes. <laughs> 
maybe Lake of Coppola Utes. On the 9th of September, they came across some Fremont pictographs, which are still visible today, despite their age. They were ghostly cloudburst figures or spirits. And by that I mean the figures representing the summer monsoons that I talked about, I think, in the first episode of this series. Again, that's just a theory, but I like it. There were also bighorn sheep and dogs, plants which are probably corn, horned beings, shields, warriors with shields and spears, and a whole lot more that uh, Ascalante describes. Like I said before, I will be doing a series on the Fremont peoples, who were contemporaries to the Anasazi and ancestral Puebloans, albeit to the north. They would not have been related to the Utes, although they may have had similar ancient ancestors. Still, the Utes may have understood these sites as being old and significant, and may have even imparted their own significance onto them. They named, the expedition, named the canyon with the many petroglyphs and pictographs, Canyon Pintado, or Painted Canyon. Also in the canyon, they apparently found some ore, which Miera, the learned geologist, as well as everything else he was so far in life, I mean, the man was a true Renaissance man. Briggs writes of this entry in the journal while quoting it, and it's uh, worth repeating. Don Bernardo Mierda said it was one of those which the miners call tepustet, copper, and that it was an indication of gold ore. Tepustet is the first of a number of Aztec words to crop up in the diary. Readers may be able to recognize others for a flavor distinct from Spanish. Mierda had become a geologist too. On this matter, we assert nothing, Escalante wrote. Nor will we assert anything because we are not experienced in mines, and because a more detailed examination than the one we were able to make on this occasion is always necessary. End his quote. Mierda, who of a certainty read the completed diary, may not, in his vanity, have appreciated these remarks. End all quotes. In truth, D and E may not have wanted to be responsible for a literal gold rush into this territory, if there wasn't actually any gold. I would like to now just read a passage from Briggs about their current path, because he just writes so well. Still in barren country, they crossed an invisible line into what in 1847 would become Mormon country, part of a projected state of Deseret of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. From a Book of Mormon word interpreted to mean honeybee, Deseret was envisioned to take in not only Utah, but huge sections of New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, Nevada, Idaho, Wyoming, Oregon, and even California. The United States, needless to say, refused the bee access to so much potential honey. End quote. I'll cover the Mormon Battalion Deseret in the Utah War one of these days. On that same day, the 9th, the expedition made it to the White River, a river I had to look up because I do not know uh, anything about it. Every other river named so far, I'm familiar with, even tangentially, but uh, again, this area is unknown territory to me. And to the Padres. They were totally in the hands of the Laguna Silvestre at this point, and he was taking them on quite the journey. They named the White River El Rio de San Clemente, who my research told me was the third successor to Peter, way back in the first century AD, not long after Christ. I live near San Clemente in Orange County, California, but they, the Californios, call it San Clemente. After the river on the 10th, They traversed rockless hills, plains, and passed many a buffalo trace, or the paths that buffalo make in the wild. If you're interested in my favorite creature, my first ever episode of the podcast was Over the Bison. It's called Buffalo Kingdom. You should go give it a listen. Around this time, our team was running low on both water and food. The water part, though, was worrisome obviously, because without it, the animals may lep up out the camp in the middle of the night 
as they had previously done, and will do again. Spoiler alert. But for the humans, the lack of food was also presenting itself a problem. In the journal, Escalante blames the hungry Cebuaranas for tearing through their food. But as Roberts writes, quote, That the men thought they could possibly carry enough food for the whole journey, no matter how many pack animals they allocated for the purpose, signals a disastrous miscalculation. End quote. I could not agree more. And they have a lot of traveling left to do still. But at this desperate point, a miracle saves them. And that miracle is my good friend and, just mentioned, the bison. After realizing the big beasts must be nearby with the freshness of their traces, they sent two of the crew out to see how far away the bison really were. They thankfully reported, not far. Here's Escalante. We dispatched others on the fleetest horses and, after chasing it for about three leagues, they killed it. Then, at 7.30 at night, they brought back a grand supply of meat. End quote. The bison saves the day again. So they may not have used a musket and shot it like I originally thought, which is a fact I took for granted until reading Briggs, who, as usual, writes beautifully about them not using a gun, but rather, well, I'll just read this. Who the hunter hero was, Escalate didn't say, nor how the buffalo was slain. In the next century, Josiah Gregg, a chronicler of the Santa Fe Trail, would admire the skill of Cibaleros, Hispano and Pueblo buffalo hunters on the plains. A buffalo having been singled out amid a herd, a Cibalero shouldered his horse up to it and drove a lance down past its rib into the heart, Greg said. End quote. So with these hardy New Mexicans, a raffle may not have even been necessary, and truthfully, may not have even been as effective. And that is hardcore and awesome. They named their camp that evening after the buffalo, Arroyo del Cibolo. They then stayed in camp an extra day to prepare jerk and dry the meat so it wouldn't go to waste and uh, spoil. On the 13th of September, the crew finally arrived at the Green River, that river that flows through Dinosaur National Monument and eventually into the Colorado, near Canyonlands National Park Island in the Sky. To the D&E crew, this was the largest river they had come to yet, larger than the Colorado. Surprisingly, their Laguna Gad, Silvestre, wasn't even sure if it ever met up with the Colorado River, which really wasn't that far away from where they were at the moment. Although, the American Indians they run into will constantly feign no, feign no knowledge of the, of the land they inhabit. It was either a ploy to keep from being a continual guide, a trick to confuse the Spaniards, a la Rivera, or they just genuinely were unaware. I highly doubt the last one. But maybe by the late 1700s, the area of the greater American Southwest... And the people that lived there had changed so much that knowledge such as the land around them wasn't as strong as it had been once before. Well, I have not researched enough of this to make an educated guess, but I sure can make an uneducated one. And with that caveat out of the way, I do think the area of the American West changed dramatically after the Europeans came with their disease and their horses and their gun trade and their wars and conquering. From the Athabascan Navajo and Apache pouring down from the northwest, Canada and Alaska to fill in the abandoned areas of the southwest. Which, the abandonment in the 12 and 1300s was not the Europeans' fault, of course. If you've listened to the Ancient One series, but rather the abandonment was caused by the civil strife the Anasazi, ancestral Puebloans, and Mesa Verdeans had amongst themselves. The Navajo and Apache, though, they arrive and cause trouble in the Four Corners after the Spanish subjugated the Puebloans. Who knows what catalyst caused them to rapidly flee the cold north. Then there's the rise of the once Wyoming Shoshone branch of Native Americans 
who would become the Comanche powerhouse, quote-unquote, empire, after European horses fell in their lap. And then there's the introduction of eastern Great Lakes tribes into the area of the western Great Plains and eastern Rockies, such as the Sioux, the Dakotas, and the Cheyenne. In reality, by 1776, the West looked dramatically different than it had in 1276, just before the abandonment, or even 1476, just before the Spanish arrived, and even much different than it would in 1876 after the Mormons and the Americans, only 100 years after our story. Not to mention the year of the bicentennial of the founding of the United States of America, 1976. Think about how different it was then than it was in 1776. I wonder what the West and the Southwest will look like in 2076. I'll be 89, and maybe still recording podcasts. We'll see. Back to our Dominguez and Escalante crew and their adventure. They just found the Green River, and it's large and scary, and their Laguna Indian guide is oblivious to where it goes, or so he says. So they end up calling it the San Buenaventura River, or the River of St. Good Fortune. They mentioned that this is the river that Fray Alonso de Posada claimed was the river that separates the Ute and the Comanches, despite Posada never actually saying the word Comanche or ever going to this area. But wait a minute. Who is Fray Alonso de Posada? And is he necessary enough to our story to go down a huge rabbit hole? Well, let's find out. And yes, yes he is, obviously. I'm the king of rabbit holes. I will go down them. Our tangent starts with a man named Don Diego de Piñalosa Briqueño y Verdugo, who we will call Don Diego for short, for obvious reasons. But do not confuse this Don Diego with the man we spent uh, two episodes ago talking about, Don Diego de Vargas. So this Don Diego was from Peru. And he also, just like our last Don Diego, this Don Diego was also governor of New Mexico. Except he was governor during the early 1660s, pre-revolution. He was quite an adventurer and a man with an appetite to explore. While governor, he visited all of the Pueblos, as all governors do, but at the Jemez, Zuni, and Tewa Pueblos, and many others, he heard the rumors of Quivira, which is on the Great Plains, maybe Kansas or Texas. It's kind of like the land of Tehuayo, but on the plains. It really does not exist. But he heard the rumors of Tehuayo as well, somewhere in the Rockies. The, the land of emergence, if you'll recall, I keep talking about, even with the Laguna Utes. He became obsessed, Don Diego did, with finding these places, Quivira and Tehuayo. But in typical New Mexico fashion, Don Diego would find himself in trouble with the church, something I talked about at length a few episodes back. That was quite a common theme in New Mexican Spanish history prior to the Reconquest. It kind of disappears afterwards, actually. Because of this trouble, though, Don Diego was sent to DF, where he was put on trial with the Inquisition, and he lost. He was then exiled from New Spain and sent back to Europe. But... That did not stop his explorer side, and while in London and Paris, he visited the courts of the aristocracy and the rich to drum up some support for a visit to North America, another visit. He wanted to go north of the Spanish-held territories to find these rumored mythical places. All he needed was an army and an armada. His message in these courts, was actually so persistent that even the king back in Spain heard of his stories and sent a letter to the viceroy of New Spain to inquire about what this exiled man was talking about. I'll now read from the letter that the king of Spain wrote in 1678. In my royal council of the Indies, information has been received that Don Diego de Piñalosa, who wears the attire of a knight of Alcantara, and is called the Count of Santa Fe, a native of Lima, 
is in Paris, and that the cause of being in that court has resulted from some embarrassing experiences which, as governor of New Mexico, in the administration of the viceroy, the Marquise of Manquera, your predecessor, he had with the tribunal of the Inquisition, it imprisoned him, confiscated his property, and he left, deprived of his office and exiled from that kingdom. From there he went to England, and from there to Paris, where he has been for five years. He has married a French woman, and he has given a paper to the most Christian king concerning the conquest and discovery of the provinces of Quivira and Tehuayo, assuring them that they are very rich in silver and gold, offering to go himself with the fleet on account of being very well informed concerning all the Indies. Furthermore, he has been given a reply to the effect that with the present war waging it would not be possible to discuss the enterprise, but that as soon as there was peace, it would be considered. So the king of Spain knew what was up with Don Diego, who would actually go on to further suggest to the French king, King Louis XIV, that he would absolutely lead some Frenchmen and soldiers to the mouth of the Rio Grande, which is the border of modern Texas and Mexico, the same river that flows through Santa Fe. And even more than that, Don Diego would help seize the rich mines of Santa Barbara in Tampico, which is pretty far south into Mexico on the Caribbean coast, really. It was a bold proposition. And it was a proposition the French could not agree to, at least with Don Diego leading it. So the French told Don Diego that since we're warring with the Spanish and all, we can't send you out there right now, because that will be bad form. But what they should have told the Don was, thank you for the information, we'll get our best man on it. That best man was a certain Frenchman I mentioned a few episodes ago, actually. LaSalle. That man that would, after hearing all of this information that Don Diego was given the French, LaSalle would be told all of this, and he would sail down the Mississippi and claim the river and all the land around it, from the Gulf of Mexico to New France. He would claim it all for France. We know how LaSalle and his colony ended up. It wasn't pleasant for a lot of them, for sure. Although, like I said, some of the survivors end up in New Mexico after the reconquest by Don Diego de Vargas. Other survivors eventually did make it up to New France, and more on them in a moment. After hearing about all this French exploration and intrigue, for a second time, the Spanish king asked his council of the Indies, and the Indies is, they thought they were, I guess, on the Indian subcontinent at first, so everything west of, like, the Atlantic Ocean was the Indies. And so the council of the Indies is kind of the people who ran the show for, for the Americas. So, for a second time, the Spanish king asked his Council of the Indies for a report on what all this Quivira and Tehuayo business was about. And this report began the action of chasing down the already dead La Salle, which would begin the eventual colonization of Tejas by the Spanish, mostly as a buffer zone against the French, but later it would become a buffer zone against the Comanche, and then the Americans. So, about those French who made their way up to New France, or modern-day Canada. Once in the territory, they told their tale of the Great Plains and the Indians, and of Quivira and Tehuayo. They told these tales to a man who himself had spent quite some time in the Americas. A man who traveled the Missouri River, and who encountered many an Indian. And a man who greatly admired the Native Americans, and their freedoms, and a man who recorded many of their oral traditions even, including the oral tradition of how the Mississippian culture, or American Indians near the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes, he recorded how many years ago in the 1200s, at the same time as the overthrow of the Anasazi Chaco and Aztec Altipetl by the Mesa Verdeans, or at least something similar to that, so a long time ago, these Mississippians had overthrown their leader, and chopped off his head. He then, this Frenchman, wrote about how the Mississippians had lived free and clear of tyranny ever since then. And these stories, whether true or not, but these stories he recorded, may have influenced certain liberty-minded thinkers in England and eventually the American colonies. 
But I'm getting way off topic here on this tangent. This adventurous military nobleman was named Baron de la Hontan. He was mentioned by Briggs in the beginning of the introduction episode. Is everyone still with me? Goodness. This rabbit hole has turned into a mine shaft. In one of those books that he wrote later in life, the Baron de la Hontan used these tales by these survivors, the LaSalle survivors. He used their tales and the American Indian tales um, to weave his own tale of a great lake of salt at the end of a long river in the area immediately north of the territory of New Mexico. This would later influence our man Escalante, but by way of Posada, who I mentioned at the beginning of this rabbit mine shaft. Fray Olanza de Posada was in New Mexico as a missionary from 1650 to 1660, and while there he visited many a pueblo and heard many a stories. Immediately after this post as a missionary, during the reign of Don Diego de Peñalosa as governor, the Don Diego I mentioned earlier, who was trying to mount an expedition to the New World in France, whew, during the reign of said Don Diego, Posada was given the job of custodian of the Custodia de la Conversión de San Pablo del Nuevo México, which gave him access to all of the missionaries' reports. He was a man with access to a lot of information on New Mexico and the surrounding area, and he would constantly be acquiring more information about the land and its people. So, in 1685, that report that the king ordered a couple times on these lands of Quivira and Tehuayo, the writing of that report fell on Posada, which he would accomplish in 1686 or 87. In it, he documents everything he knew about these lands, and really, about all of the lands of New Mexico and what lies in the north and east and west. It is truly an in-depth and descriptive report for the time, especially since a lot of what he writes down was a completely blank space on the map for the Europeans. But in this report, he confidently affixes a geographic X on the map of North America, north of New Mexico, where this lake of Copala, or Tehuayo, the place of emergence, this place rich in wealth, truly is. The fact that Escalante mentions Posada means that he had read that report from 90 years before. And the fact that he was calling these people the Lagunas, or lake people, means he probably believed they were from the Lake of Copala. Maybe this was an unwritten goal of the expedition from the get-go, really, to find this somewhat semi-mythical place. Remember the captured Puebloan who told Onyate about how Pope, the leader of the revolution, had spoken with the three supernatural beings in the Kiva who were coming and going from the Lake of Copala with secrets and plans for their, the people's next emergence from Tehuayo? And that would happen after they killed all the Spanish and religious? Remember also that the Aztecs themselves, the rich and powerful leaders of Mesoamerica that the Spanish had conquered, which set off the conquering of the New World, the Aztecs themselves, who may have even been related to the Anasazi, the Aztecs themselves, including their leader Montezuma, claimed their people came from a lake to the north called Tehuayo, just like the Mesa Verdeans. The Spanish had never found this lake, yet for over 300 years, this possibly magnificent place was lingering in the minds of the Spanish. Think of all the gold and silver and souls they could save. David Roberts sums it up nicely when he wrote, quote, One of the major goals, then, of the Dominguez Escalante expedition was to find Tehuayo and to discover whether or not it was the rumored land of incalculable wealth and luxury. End quote. But wait. There's more. In the 1740s, while preaching to the Navajo, a Fray Carlos Delgado wrote a letter detailing how the Navajos described Tehuayo, a letter which Escalante no doubt was aware of and had read. 
Delgado wrote, quote, Information which I, Fray Carlos Delgado, give to your reverence Fray Pedro Navarrete of El Gran Tehuayo, which is between west and north. It is distant about 200 leagues more or less from the Custodio. In this entry that I made to Navajo, I heard some of the natives tell how this Tehuayo, so renowned, is made up of various nations, for in it are found people from all of them both civilized from among those whom we are governing, as well as others who are heathen. One division, or city, is so large that, after their manner of expressing themselves, they say that one cannot walk around it within eight days. In it lives a king of much dignity and ostentation, who, as they say, neither looks nor speaks to anyone, except very briefly, such is his severity. He rules all the nations in those regions, and I am sure they desire to be acquainted with our holy habit, for they say that in former times a religious went there and contracted a fatal illness. After his death, they kept him in a box, which they gave one to understand is of silver. The said religious merited this honor because of his having ketishized the king. All his successors regard as relics a shrine of gold, and the articles used in saying mass, as well as the things that he used. End quote. So there's an enormous city you cannot walk around in eight days with multiple nations who revere a dead Spanish Catholic missionary enough to encase him in a silver box and whom are just waiting to be preached to again? Delgado would never make that trip, but no doubt d and &E were now making it for him. Whew. I'll be honest, I'm proud of that tangent and its many, many tentacles. It rather nicely borrows from so many themes and stories that I've already discussed, while also bringing in some new tantalizing arms. But with that out of the way, let's get back to our d and &E crew. For the next two days, after finding the Green River, the largest river they'd come to yet, a river they named the River of the Saint of Good Fortune, for the next two days, they'd camp there on its banks. They'd also get themselves another bison, albeit a little one this time. It is also here where they reached their most northerly point of the entire expedition. They'd take a reading on the astrolabe. It would be incorrect. But m and still understood they were too far north, way too far north. Briggs would write that they were, quote, 385 air miles from Santa Fe while having gained only about 180 on Monterey. End quote. They were really going to the Pacific coast on a very roundabout fashion. This entrada should be called the d &E detour instead of the d and &E expedition at this point. While camped at the river and waiting, Joaquin, the very young Laguna, who had ridden high in saddle with Joaquin Lain the blacksmith. Apparently, Joaquin, as a quote-unquote prank, grabbed and mounted a very fiery horse bronco, which began a bucking. He then raced across the open terrain at top speed, only for the horse to stick its hoof in a prairie dog hole, throw off the quote-unquote horse breaker, and the horse broke its own neck. Thankfully, the child survived, although he was apparently, quote, shedding a flood of tears, end quote. I doubt the men of the expedition expected it to be playing at babysitting or consoling, but that's what they now found themselves doing. That night, Silvestre the Laguna slipped away from camp without being noticed to sleep alone. Briggs jokingly writes, quote, to escape a Spano snoring, it might jocularly be speculated, end quote. Once the team had left the banks of the Green River, two days later, on the 16th of September, Silvestre curiously donned the woolen cloak they had given him to be a guide for the first time, as he led them over little rivers and up high and very stony ridges. And remember, this is right after the night where he went off and slept by himself. His demeanor seemed to puzzle d and &E. As the Laguna contemplated continuing on their current trajectory or going back to the river. <laughs> 
Might he have been wondering if he should really be taking them to his encampment? Is it time to employ the Rivera tactic yet again? At the top of this hill, though, the group discovered fresh tracks of about 12 horses and some men on foot. Sylvester claimed it was the dreaded Comanche, but the Padres were leery, and this omen did not bode well for our intrepid leaders, who pretty much immediately assumed Sylvester was up to no good. They began thinking maybe these were tracks left by some Sabuagana Utes that Sylvester had talked to when they left him, like in that little spot briefly, when both went their separate ways, right before they had to convince him to come back along with them. They thought maybe those Sabuaganas were going to rob them of their belongings and horses and blame it on the Comanches, who it was well known now, and probably known earlier, that they were long gone, the Comanches. They were on their way back to the Buffalo Kingdom. What if Silvestre, putting on the cloak that they gave him way back at the Gunnison River, but which he had yet to wear no matter how cold it had gotten, maybe donning that cloak was a signal to his compatriots to steal the horses? They then remembered that, hey, didn't he go off and sleep alone last night? Maybe his conversation hadn't happened at the camp, but it happened last night. The journal makes it clear that Dominguez and Escalante discussed this, but never told Silvestre their worries. Did they discuss it only amongst themselves or with others in the group? Had M P or Andre Munez been the one to suggest such trickery? In the end, as the day progressed, it turns out... Quote, he gave us convincing proofs of his innocence. End quote. So they were wrong this time, and it may have been a little old-fashioned distrust of the Indians, but it's always important to trust your gut feelings, especially in situations like our expedition members find themselves in. They eventually went back to the Green River and continued their journey, and during said journey they in fact learned that Sylvester had been telling the truth. It indeed had been Comanche who were hunting both Sabuagana Utes and their favorite prey, the buffalo. On September 17th, Silvestre led the team to a high point in the terrain and pointed out to them the confluence of the Green and White Rivers. That night, they saw smoke from distant fires. In somewhat related news, on this day, the 17th of September, 1776, 700 miles to the west, not far from their goal of Monterey, the Presidio at San Francisco was completed, ushering in that city's beginnings. The team then traveled west for the next five days in earnest search for the lake and the lagunas. Those days were filled with Fremont ruins, thick brush and cactuses, and thick forests, and creek crossings, and detours, and setbacks, and turnbacks, and crisscrossing across the land. It seems Silvestre may have been employing the Rivera tactic after all. He did indeed have first-hand eyewitness knowledge of the lack of food and supplies her team was struggling with. May that have influenced his decision? If only he could keep them wandering through these mysterious regions. Maybe they'd turn around? At this time, they were traveling through the heart of what is known today as the Uinta Basin. Briggs has this to say of the land they were encountering. Our expedition was now in the heart of the Uinta Basin and traversing what would become the Uinta and Ure reservations. The Uintas, for pine land, are another division of Ute stock. Ure was the chief whose name is perpetuated by a monument at Montrose. To protect Ute ancestral rights against Anglo intruders, President Lincoln in 1861 would proclaim the Uinta Reservation to encompass almost all of the basin. Utes farther west were reluctant to move over here, but Mormon leader Brigham Young told them, quote, If you do not sell your land to the government, they will take it. We shall increase and we shall occupy this Utah Lake Valley and the next and the next and so on until we occupy the whole of them. The Utes moved. The Tebowachis, Sabuaganas, and other northerly Colorado Utes in 1882, by federal decree, were shunted here. 
hence the addition of the name Ure. Twenty-five years later, an Indian giver congress broke a treaty by opening the reservation to Anglo homesteaders. It now is a mere 384,000 acres, mainly quote-unquote badlands, remnants of the Uinta domain, end quote. While traveling through this basin, they would notice, and indeed Escalante would write about, today's Uinta Mountains, but what they called Sierra Blanca de los Lagunas, or the White Mountains of the Lake Utes. They are, I learned, these mountains, they are the only east-west trending mountains in the lower 48 and the highest peaks in Utah. There are other east-west trending mountains, though, I would No, personally, I live not too far from the San Bernardino and other Southern California ranges, which do the exact same thing. But these are admittedly much smaller than the Rintas. Actually, not too much smaller, really. The highest of these mountains would be King's Peak. King's Peak is around 13,500 feet. Escalante wrote that they would soon be going through those mountains, which must have seemed a difficult feat to swallow. During the trek, which was quote-unquote almost impassable terrain, they had a horse get lost, and they lost a horse, as in it died. Dominguez would be injured by a tree, no doubt running knee first into a branch in a very thick wood, that's how I imagine, but apparently in the writing, a tree took out Dominguez. And to pile on, An unceasingly cold wind swept through their limbs from the west. Winter was approaching. They had no idea what it was going to throw at them. But they were getting a taste here. It was so cold, Escalante wrote that, quote, even the water which stood close to the fire all night was frozen by morning, end quote. It seems a complete turnaround from the other night on the banks of the Green River of San Buenaventura. On the 21st of September, the fathers were fed up and ever more suspicious of their guide. Quote, The guide, anxious to get there sooner than we ourselves could make it, was hurrying so fast that he vanished in the forest at every step, and we knew not where to follow him. He was ordered to go slow and always within our sight. End quote. The going didn't get easier as they came upon rough and rugged, rocky mountain terrain of sinking and stumbling in earth and over rocks. On that day, the young Laguna, Joaquin, arrowed some trout from a stream, today known as Strawberry River. Nearby, in a very pleasant pasture, the Laguna Silvestre told the team that they used to live in this lovely spot, but had to flee on account of the Comanche's reign of terror against them. They eventually came to the Wasatch Mountains, which has peaks up to 12,000 feet. After crossing these peaks, one enters the Great Basin. And as a matter of fact, this d and crew were probably the first Europeans to ever step foot in the Great Basin, beating even Garces down south. Within the Great Basin, there was a single water outlet to the sea. Every creek or river or stream will simply lead to a dried up lake and disappear. Of course, If you listened to the episode over the Mammoth Eaters and the Ancient Ones, you know these basins were once impossibly large and extremely deep lakes that sported banks teeming with ancient megafauna and the intrepid hunters who pursued them, along with innumerable migrating birds, some of which still land in the empty playas today. By some quirk of ancient biological knowledge, they have yet to forget. Escalante would remark while in those Wasatch Mountains that the nights were the coldest ones the crew had faced thus far. The night of the 22nd, they saw more fires and smoke signals, and they tried to answer, including Silvestre yelling into the night in his language at around, apparently, 2 a.m. Although the signals of smoke were answered, there was no answer from the others in his own language. It's possible no one heard him. Maybe the wind carried his voice away. Or maybe no one spoke his language. Or those that heard him wanted to stay anonymous. In any case, the Padres were uneasy 
Might they have been Comanche? Their uneasiness didn't wane the following day as the team grew closer to the banks of the mythical lake in the encampment of the Lagunas. Despite the fact that Silvestre told them the Lagunas were going to treat them very kindly, don't worry guys. They were then led to a high point and shown the lake. The lake of the Lagunas. The lake people. The lake we call Utah Lake. The lake our team will call Nuestra Señora de la Marque de los Timpanagotsis. The lake that they were assuming was the Lake of Coppola. This was finally the land of Tehuayo. Also from that spot, they saw that many smoke signals had been started and were spreading, which d took to mean their arrival had been noticed and the warning had been sent. But absent was the impossibly fantastic city, which would take eight days to walk around. No doubt this was noticed, although not recorded. Anxious to finally speak with the Lagunas, the team set up camp early, quite early, in an area known today as the Spanish Fork Valley. And then, the leader Dominguez, Andres Munez, and Silvestre, the Laguna, tore forward, quote, racing their horses as much as they could, even to the point of exhaustion, so as to get there this afternoon, end quote. There being the Laguna's home on the lake. When the three men of the expedition approached the encampment, though, they were met with, quote, some men who came out to see them with weapons in hand to defend their homes and families, end quote. That's a pretty natural reaction to strange men riding quickly into your town on horses. But then Escalante writes of the defender's turnaround when Sylvester spoke to them in their own language. Keep in mind, though, that Dominguez was there and not Escalante. And Escalante is the one who wrote the journal. Quote, as soon as Silvestri spoke to them, the show of war was changed into the finest and fondest expressions of peace and affection. They very joyfully conducted them to their little humble abodes, and after he had embraced each single one and let them know that we came in peace and that we loved them as our greatest friends. End quote. While speaking to the people and letting them all speak to Silvestre, Dominguez shared tobacco, obviously. And it seems people from all over the lake came to see this strange Spanish man, Dominguez. Dominguez also told Escalante how Silvestre told his people about how the Comanches, which were surely out there somewhere, but Silvestre told his people, quote, how after the Sabulganas had said that the Comanches would surely kill us or deprive us of our herds of horses, they had not attacked us, nor had we seen them. What the Padres had said, thus coming true. That is to say, that God would deliver us from all our enemies, and that even if we passed through their very own country, they would not detect us, nor we ourselves see them. End quote. I wonder at this point if Silvestre himself is now a Christian after days on the trail with the Padres, or if maybe there's some lavish storytelling going on by Dominguez and then Escalante. Regardless, it is true that they apparently went through some dangerous territory and nothing ill came of them or to them. So it would stand to reason that Silvestre would be relieved and excited at this and kind of be looking for an explanation. Maybe he believed the Padres about their god. Silvestre seems stricken by the fathers at this point. He ends his story to his people with, quote, only the Padres spoke the truth, that in their company one could travel all over the earth without risk, and that they were nothing but good people. End quote. He apparently had not picked up on the uneasiness and weariness that the group had had towards him the previous few days, while they thought maybe he was leading them into harm's way. Well, anyways, that was all gone now, and they were all reunited. Now that that was over, though, it was time for Dominguez to work his magic. After giving them some tobacco, obviously and as usual, he would launch into an explanation of their appearance and preach to these Lagunas how he was there to, quote, 
seek the salvation of their souls, and to show them the only means whereby they could attain it. End quote. That only way, of course, was through Christ. He told them how he was going to baptize them, that Spaniards would come live among them, he'd teach them how to farm and raise livestock, and that they'd submit and, quote, live in the manner ordered by God, and as the Padres would teach them, our great chief, whom we call king, would send them everything that was needed. Because, on seeing how they wished to be Christianized, he would already be guarding them as his children, and would be caring about them as though they were already his people. End quote. That definitely goes against Governor Mendenueta's words of not expanding the lands, seeing as how there ain't even enough Padres in New Mexico to cover that land. But hey, lucky Lagunas. Dominguez told them that they would soon have a king across the land and ocean, and he'd give them everything they'd ever need as soon as they'd drastically turn around every single aspect of their entire lives. Apparently, they listened gladly, and they were ready to do everything Dominguez asked of them. He then bid his new friends adieu after telling them, Don't worry, we're not staying long, because, get this, quote, We had to continue our traveling in order to learn about the other padre, our brother. End quote. Man, they're still looking for old Garces. Or at least that's what they're telling the American Indians to ease their worries. With, of course, the implication of moving on in search of a lost dear friend instead of staying to conquer. I'm more and more leaning towards that, but it's still odd that they would record that in the journal that they were looking for Gar says. It's like, oh no, we're not staying. We can't stay. We've got a friend to catch. Back at camp, a tired Dominguez relayed all of this to Escalante, who dutifully wrote it down in their journal. I'm sure none of the details were lavishly exaggerated. Like how the Lagunas were super ready to change their entire lives. But if you've been listening to my series over the Spanish in the Southwest, the pattern of the Native Americans being super excited about immediately converting as soon as a religious opens their mouth is one we should all be used to by now. They apparently, our crew, they apparently talked very late into the night and Silvestre all night with his people. And he had been gone a while. And he had quite some stories to tell about these strange Europeans. The following day, the rest of the group would arrive at the camp around noon. And during this visit, the expedition would learn that the Lagunas actually called themselves the Timpanagotsis, which is a word I've used a couple times. And that word translates into people of the rock water mouth or rock canyon. So people of the water rock canyon. The Sabuganas, on the other hand, call the Tipanagotsis the fish eaters, which the Tipanagotsis were not fond of being called, apparently. But they did eat a lot of fish. And Dominguez even wrote later about how they were quite good. More about these Laguna Utes, though. These Lake People Utes, Escalante won't mention the lack of anything resembling what the legends say until after the expedition, but he and Dominguez and everyone among the crew, aware of these centuries of rumors, must have been bummed as they recognized the fact that there was no gold, no silver, no massive pueblos of many nations. There aren't even any horses mentioned, which suggests the Laguna Utes had none of their own. I mean, maybe the Comanche took them all. The Plains teepees hadn't even been adopted by these Timpanagotsis yet because of the lack of said horses. So no Pueblos, no teepees, no horses, no gold, no silver. The land of Tehuayo was yet another rumor in a long line of Spanish rumors. They must have felt like Coronado and his men after Fray uh, Marcos de Niza, if I remember correctly, had promised that Zuni was an an Acropolis instead of the adobe and mud buildings they'd come across. Despite this, Escalante writes of the many timbers and woods in the mountains. He writes of the plentiful game and fish 
and geese and beavers, rabbits, deer, and even bison. Even the climate was fantastic. Or as he wrote, quote, The climate here is a good one. For having experienced cold aplenty since we left El Rio de San Buenaventura, we felt warm throughout the entire valley by day and by night. End quote. Not to mention the fact that a huge body of fresh water was right there in front of him. M&P would write the King of Spain and say how this spot, with Utah Lake, he'd describe it as being, quote, the most pleasing, beautiful, and fertile site in all New Spain, end quote. He's probably right. Everyone, it seemed, really liked and raved about this beautiful valley that the Mormons would eventually inherit and do exactly what Escalante and Mieta y Pacheco suggest, and they would turn it into quite the settlement. But that's still some 80, 70 years in the future. The Timpanagotzis told the crew that there was an even bigger lake to the north, although it was too salty to drink, and it apparently made your skin itch. Obviously, they were talking about the Great Salt Lake. But the Spanish named both Utah Lake and the Great Salt Lake, 40 miles to the north, they would call them Laguna de los Timpanagos, after their new friends. They never did go up and see the Great Salt Lake, though, which Briggs says is one of the greatest mysteries of the whole trip. Why didn't they? They were probably running out of supplies and time by this point. It is 40 miles to the north. They would have seen, if they had gone, they would have seen quite the sight. That lake, which has no outlet, and which evaporation causes the saltiness or mineralizes, that lake is eight times saltier than the ocean, or more mineral rich than the ocean. One more curious thing about these Utes, the Lagunas apparently had beards, and Don Mieta y Pacheco would record that fact on the map he would create later. But Escalante would also write about that. d &E, again, gave some sermons in front of all the gathered chiefs, which was apparently all of them this time, all the chiefs. And then, you will not be surprised to hear, the Tipa Negotis accepted the message and invited the Spanish to stay and build their houses and live among them on the lake's shores. In response, Dominguez and crew gave the quote-unquote head chief a big knife, white glass beads, and a hatchet. White glass beads were also passed around to anyone who wanted them. Dominguez then asked for an object or a token or a sign that they could take back to Santa Fe with them to prove that the people had indeed converted and had accepted Jesus, and that they were for real now friendly with the Spanish. Surprisingly, the next day, the main head chief, Cacique, presented the religious with a painting on deer skin of their proud warriors. Each one of these warriors were wearing red ochre, which represented the blood pouring from the, quote, wounds in battles with the Comanches, end quote. I would very much like to see this awesome-sounding painting on deer skin. Ah, well, everyone that writes about it would, too. No one is sure where this lovely piece of art is today, it may not have survived, or it may be in some desk drawer somewhere. This is what Briggs wrote about the artwork. Quote, On a small piece of buckskin, five men were painted with earth and red ochre. On both sides, the one with the most ochre, or as they called it, the most blood, depicted the head chief, because in the battles with the Comanches he had received the most wounds. The two other figures, not so bloody, represented subordinate chiefs, including Silvestre, and another unbloodied was not a war chief, but a man of authority among them. A shaman? At the suggestion of one companion, a cross was painted above each figure. End quote. After the gift was received, the Padres promised to return and to build a mission and to preach to the people in due time. But for now, the crew really needed a new guide. And if someone agreed to be their new guide, that they would receive a big old knife, more glass beads, and on top of it, a woolen cloak. This is the same goods they'd given Silvestre all that time ago. Thankfully for our crew, one Ute came forward and agreed to do the job. 
but in typical fashion, they really could not pronounce his name. So they dubbed him Jose Maria. They then bought some dried fish for the journey, and the rest of the day was spent talking and hanging out with their brand new friends. At midday on September 25th, the Padres decided it was time to lap up out there and head for Monterey way out west so that they could finally complete their mission. They then told the Lagunas that if any of the Lagunas got sick, to pray to God for health. But the Utes couldn't quite say all of the prayer that the Spanish gave them to, to recite, so instead they told them to just say, Jesus Maria. Escalante writes of this, quote, this they began repeating with ease, and during all the time we were making preparations to leave, they did not cease repeating these holy names. End quote. That's kind of a funny scene, if you if you kind of think about it. They're packing their bags and loading the horses, and a bunch of youths were crowding around them, chanting over and over again, Jesus Maria, Jesus Maria, Jesus Maria. I don't even think they knew what it meant. Escalante writes that they all bade them farewell, quote, most tenderly, especially Silvestre, who hugged us tightly, practically in tears, end quote. So Silvestre wasn't coming along any longer. But now they had Jose Maria, and still Joaquin, the young Laguna Ute who sat hind saddle of Joaquin Lane. Then they all left with Dominguez, and he promised he would be back within a year, a promise he would not keep. Over the next few days, the party would travel southwesterly, essentially along today's I-15. But they'd travel southwesterly instead of just straight westward, which would have put them on pace to eventually reach California. While on this trajectory, they'd run into a small group of Indians, a larger group the following day, except this group they met without their guide, so they just used sign language. And then on the 29th, they'd run into an old man who was, quote, alone in a tiny hut, and he had a beard so full and long that he looked like one of the ancient hermits of Europe. End quote. That's a curious description, honestly. But I have seen a drawing from, I think, like the 1600s of a hermit in Europe. Just a long, bearded, scary-looking dude on all fours. Uh, not many Native Americans of the time grew beards, or at least are recorded as growing beards, but these Lagunas sure did. Although I guess that's not entirely true, I suppose. I learned from David Roberts that Moctezuma himself had a beard. The Aztec Emperor. Not to mention Paiutes and Payantutes are also known to grow some nice beards every now and then. Also on that day, the 29th, they came to a large river which they thought was the San Buenaventura, a.k.a. the Green River, which they'd already crossed, but... That river, the Green River, is 120 miles to the east. This river was the Severe River. So they might be a little confused and a little lost about where they were and where they were going. The following day was an exciting one when 20 Indians showed up to their camp complete with animal bone nose piercings, buckskin loincloths, blankets of rabbit furs. They were speaking Ute and owning long, full beards. And this seems to have been an aha moment for Escalante because it is here where he mentions the old legend of the long-lost Spaniards that I mentioned in the first episode. He writes that these may be the people, quote, who perhaps gave rise to the report about Spaniards who were said to exist on the other side of El Rio de Tizon, end quote. So much for rescuing the group of conquistadors turned farmers, that had been lost in the vast deserts of the American Southwest for over 200 years. You've got to wonder, what if there really was that band of people out there, and DNA actually did find them? But when they told them in a Spanish that maybe they wouldn't even understand or comprehend, when they told them that they were taking them back, what if this long-lost group refused? What if they didn't want to be found, and they killed these religious? Not likely, but an interesting thought. On October 1st, the crew, inexplicably, while heading south, backtracked a mile and a half, crossed a river, and headed due west. Were they finally heading towards California? This route they took 
forced them to head through a small isolated group of mountains known as the Canyon Mountains, where there was no trail. That means they saw these mountains and decided to just head right up and into them, which must have been a daunting and possibly tiring, no definitely tiring task, which was made harder by the fact that it seems they were out of water. Maybe they thought there would be a spring up there, or maybe they were spying if there was any water nearby. Because luckily for them, from atop the Canyon Mountains, they did see a distant lake. They probably thought it was much like the one they had just left days ago. Utah Lake. The Lake of the Lagunas. So they rode hard towards this lake. And that day actually marks the longest day of the expedition in miles. When all is said and done, they'd traveled 36 miles that day. But in that moment, they were riding and walking as quickly as they could towards this blessed lake, which, in typical desert cartoon fashion, turned out to just be a mirage. Just a salt flat in the Great Basin. One of many. They'd search in vain for the rest of the day for water, but they wouldn't find any. They'd sleep with parched throats and tongues that evening at a campsite they named Llano Salado, Salt Plain. Not learning their lesson, though, Before they fell asleep, two of the party who had been sent ahead to look for water came back and said they definitely saw another lake for real this time, about two or three miles yonder. So after the moon had risen, giving them enough light to see, five of the party, with the entire horse herd, save one horse, went out in search for this life-saving liquid. You'll be shocked to know it was another mirage. Once it was discovered that it was another mirage, three of the five men decided to go even further in search of more water, while two of them were to stay with the horses and guard them until the three returned. They had one job. Unfortunately, the two left, fell asleep, and when they awoke, all of the horses, meaning all of the Spaniards' horses, were gone except that one. Obviously, they chose the smartest course of action, and the two nitwits lit out in opposite directions in search of the missing herd that they were supposed to have watched. I mean, falling asleep on guard duty? Letting 95% of the horses escape? That's a capital punishment offense right there. You're hanged or put in front of a firing squad. Probably even still today in a lot of places, at least falling asleep. You can't let your buddies down like that. Meanwhile, back at camp, it was now the morning of October 2nd, and, uh, there were no horses. And all five of the men sent out for water had yet to return, which means they also did not have water. And now they're down five dudes and all but one horse. But then, one of those two men who fell asleep, and then had ran off in a direction after the herd, well, he stumbled bedraggled and tired and toe up. He came back into the D&E camp and told the tale, ending with, I don't know where anyone else is. So immediately, Juan Pedro Cisneros jumped on the last remaining horse and rode it bareback, meaning no saddle. But he jumped on the horse and he rode it hard to go track down them lost horses and the men. When David Roberts sums up the next part of this story very well, so I will just quote his telling of it. Desperately thirsty horses will usually backtrack to find the last water they encountered. And sure enough, Cisneros found the whole herd halfway back to the previous night's camp. He managed to return with the missing horses by noon. It was a spunky performance. Riding bareback without water 36 miles and rounding up the spooked horses in a mere six hours. End quote. That is quite the spunky performance indeed. Talk about a real caballero. Shortly after the rescue of the horses, the three men who had gone further to look for the water finally returned, except they had some company. Among them were six bearded and nose-pierced Indians, much like the ones they'd met the previous day. And then, almost to dispel the notion I brought up earlier in this episode that Native Americans must not have had the same running prowess by the late 1700s, immediately after they told these six bearded Native Americans about their one remaining guy who was lost out in the wilderness, The leader of these Indians understood the gravity of the situation and sent four of his own men in four different directions to find him and return him. Which, obviously they did in pretty short order. Escalante says of this kindness, It was a gesture deserving the greatest gratitude and worthy of admiration in so wild a folk who had never before seen people like us. That's pretty rare praise of the 
American Indians from Escalante. He still managed to call them wild folk, but to the Spanish, they definitely were a wild people. These wild people, Dini would learn after this fiasco had played out, but these people called themselves the Tirapangui, and again, Escalante commented on their impressive facial hair. In typical Catholic friar zeal, as repayment for saving their man, Dominguez and Escalante immediately began preaching the word of God to these Tirapangui. It was the usual sermon of God in baptism, but with the added benefit of God's divine punishment thrown in this time, I'm not sure why they threw that in there. And I'm actually not sure how they were communicating with these Native Americans, unless they also spoke some Timpanagotzi, which the names are somewhat similar, so it's possible they were Ute or Paiute. While they were preaching, though, more of the Tirapangui filtered in to listen to these crazy foreigners who can't find water and lost all their horses. Obviously, according to Escalante, these people ate it up. Now, whether they really did or not is only for the Lord to know, but the Padres sure did record that they did. They also promised they'd be back to teach him some more, which, you know, they won't keep that promise. At this point, it may be tempting to think he was making up the Native Americans' jubilance at accepting the good Lord's word, but when he was working with the Hopis the year before, he had zero success. Remember when I talked about how the Hopis kicked out the Spanish and the religious? And... They were free from their churches and religious fervor for, like, essentially forever. Awatobi and its massacre ring any bells? They apparently still allowed the Spanish to proselytize, but they weren't very open to the message, it seems. And it's not like the Spanish learned Hopi. Well, Escalante didn't lie about that, so I doubt he's lying about this. Unless Dominguez was forcing his hand, but I doubt that as well. There just wasn't much to gain for lying about any of this, truthfully. And later he will be open about even more failures among the Hopi. That being said, the passage in the journal about the crew leaving is almost unbelievable. I mean, unless these men really possessed extremely high amounts and quality of, like, the Holy Ghost or Spirit. I suppose it's possible. After the sermon, and this is what I'm referencing when I talk about the crew leaving... After the sermon, the Tirapangui very surprisingly agreed that they would do whatever the religious asked of them, including going to live with the Timpanagotzi, or the Lagunas, on the lake. That was quite a distance away, but they would do that as long as the Padres came back and preached to them again. Escalante then writes, Scarcely did they see us depart when all, following their chief, who started first, burst out crying copious tears, so that even when we were quite a distance away, we kept hearing the tender laments of these unfortunate little sheep of Christ, lost along the way simply for not having the light. They touched our hearts so much that some of our companions could not hold back the tears. End quote. I mean, the Spirit can make one have strong emotions, but this is quite strong, dramatically strong. It's possible the group's mental health was somewhat fraying at this point after two months in the wilderness among the wilder people, as they skirted the Colorado Plateau, which is, the Colorado Plateau is absolutely a place filled with mystery and power and spiritualism, and what the French call a certain, I don't know what. I know I felt it though. I know I've conveyed it here for y'all on this podcast before too. And up on the website, I have a short story about it as well. There's just something about the Colorado Plateau and its many canyons, Peaks, sandstone hoodoos, and arches, and natural bridges. The orange and red walls. Thousand-foot sheer drops. The dangerous, thick, colorful rivers. All the ruins, the ghostly petroglyphs and pictographs that dot the entire landscape. It's a storied place. That's why I love it so much. That's why I'm talking to y'all about it. Maybe it was all starting to wear on our group here after so much time bushwhacking through tough terrain. Uh, it wasn't going to get any easier for the d crew from here on out either. But at least the horses were watered. On October 3rd, the crew left and headed pretty much straight south instead of the nearly straight west they'd been on so confidently, a course which had taken them over mountains and through salt flats, and had nearly gotten them in quite the pickle. 
In this southerly direction, the group traveled through rocky marshes that unfortunately did not offer any real drinking water despite being wet. Right? And at one point, Andres Munez was thrown from his horse, which caused him to smack his face on a hard surface, which was probably a submerged rock in this mucky marsh. Not to mention the going wasn't easy on the horses either. They were making rather slow time those first couple of days. And then, on October 5th, their luck continued to change for the worse. That morning, without saying a single word to anyone, the Timpanagotzi guide, Jose Maria, walked out. He just vanished in the direction of his people's lakeside homeland, right before DNE's eyes. Escalante writes of the incident, quote, Jose Maria, the Laguna, turned back and left us without an adieu. We saw him leave the king's camp, but did not want to say anything to him, nor to have him followed and brought back, so as to allow him complete liberty. End quote. I mean, that sucks. You're now down a guide, but at least you have Joaquin, right? Well, according to the journal, the DNA expedition was now out in the wilderness, surrounded by hostile everything, without, quote, without anyone who knew about the country ahead, even if from hearsay, end quote. I guess this land was as foreign to their remaining team and a goatsy guide, Joaquin, as it was to the Spanish Padres. Although, that line, even if from hearsay, does kind of indicate that not even Jose Maria knew where he was going from first-hand experience. It kind of sounds like he was just along for the ride, and he was making as educated a guess as anyone about what lay ahead, really. The detour west and then abrupt detour south makes a little more sense when you realize they were all, guides included, but they were all just wandering in the wilderness, blind leading the blind. After morning prayers, though, which incidentally was the cause of the fathers not going after Jose Maria, you simply cannot interrupt morning prayers, but after said morning prayers, things got a little cleared up with the Padres about the fleeing guide. Apparently. The evening before, Juan Pedro Cisneros, the bareback riding caballero ex um, mayor of Zuni, Juan Pedro Cisneros asked his servant, Simon Lucero, to come over and pray the Virgin's Rosary with him, which was probably custom and habit. But for whatever reason, Lucero, the servant, flat out refused. Which, while usually not leading to violence can rather easily lead to arguments and accusations of laziness among families, even today, or at least when I was growing up. Thankfully, I have the coolest dad who doesn't have a violent tendon in his body, and a sweet mom with the patience of an actual saint. There were five of us kids, so end of night prayer time was a challenge, nightly, if my memory serves me correctly. Oh, but I promised dear listener I was an angel. I never once disobeyed my parents. Back to this encampment, though. On this October 5th day in 1776, Cisneros and Lucero fought. Again. This could just be because of the general unraveling of the entire crew that I mentioned a few minutes ago. That may have been happening without them knowing, just the unraveling. Like, we've all seen the movies or the TV episodes where this happens. The Thing. The X-Files episode copying The Thing. Lost. Any just shipwreck or adventure story, everyone eventually gets tired of each other and you kind of lose patience. I'm absolutely convinced that these hardships had something to do with this fight between Cisneros and Lucero. It isn't totally random that the disagreement and fisticuffs happened at this moment in the journey. These men have been cooped up with each other for two months, two long Hard months traveling through very tough and rough land and alien terrain and meeting strange people. All the while, every day, the tensions and anxiety were heightened, and occasionally surviving was questionable. It's enough to wear even the hardiest warrior down, or most pious religious. Well, after prayer and learning this story of the fight that Jose Maria witnessed, Dominguez and Escalante ran... Uh, Jose Maria down and tried to convince him to return. They said, quote, Those involved were not angry at each other, and that even when a parent corrected his youngster as it now had happened, they never reached the point of killing each other as he was thinking, and therefore he should not be scared. End quote. 
killing each other. My goodness. Apparently explaining that violent parents didn't want to actually kill their children while physically beating them did not convince Jose Maria to stay. So, he was gone. And with his physical presence being gone, so too, according to Escalante, his spiritual salvation was gone. Quote, We felt very bad about this incident because we had wanted to hasten his salvation, which now he will not be able to attain that soon. End quote. I guess by that soon he meant that he wouldn't be able to save him until he returned again to his people in a year, which he would not do, unfortunately. I guess for everyone involved now. This sour event led the Spaniards to stay put for the whole day while they recuperated and planned out their next move. It seemed like, to me, Jose Maria really had no idea where he was leading them anyways, but he was confident in his blindly leading them regardless. A sort of fake it till you make it. And I guess that's me. Every time I go on a hike with my wife and slightly, somewhat, maybe lose the way or the trail or the path or slightly go a little off track, although it turns out I'm always right, but there has been like one time where I accidentally added a couple miles of hot, annoying, sandy hike to our already 11 miles. Anyways, since Jose Maria departed, the crew felt completely lost. Even though I think they were somewhat lost even with him, they just didn't allow that fact to settle in. But the way he used hearsay says in his bones Escalante knew Jose Maria was just guessing. But now the safety net, safety net full of holes, mind you, it is a net, but the perceived safety net was gone, and now they were leery of setting out on their own. At least before someone was saying this way or that way, even if they were just pulling it out of their butt. Now when asked which direction, only silence greeted the leaders of the expedition. To remedy this, D and E sent out two scouts to, quote, find out if the Sierra's western side, and likewise the valley that was there, could be negotiated and furnished any hope of finding water sources, end quote. When the two scouts returned after dark, they returned with heartbreaking news. First, the mountain had no good pass with which to travel through. Second, there wasn't no water beyond it anyways. I don't personally know this terrain at all where they're at right now. I have never been this far west in central Utah, so I'm clueless as to these mountains and the land they're trudging through. Well, I've been to Utah countless times, but I've never traveled west of I-15. So when David Roberts, who retraced as best he could, not the first, nor will he be the last one to do so, but he retraced the expedition's path as best he could, so I know he's seen this area. Not to mention he's a very accomplished mountaineer and explorer, so I'll quote him about what's going on in the journal at this point. As Sharon, that's his wife, uh, he's very sick with cancer at this point. As Sharon drove slowly south on Route 257, I stared out the passenger side window, trying to make Escalante's account fit the landscape. It simply made no sense except perhaps for the comment about the scarcity of water and pasturage. The high and rugged Sierra that Escalante cites as a serious barrier simply doesn't exist. A pair of short chains of rocky hills stretching north to south called the San Francisco Mountains and the Wawa Mountains rise some 2,000 feet above the plain, but both are easily skirted on the north. The Spaniards' camp on October 5th was very close to the old Black Rock Railroad siding. From there today, a dirt road stretches, mostly in straight lines, some 60 miles to the Nevada border. Nothing but the lack of water and pasturage could have blocked the expedition. Yet Escalante claimed that the scouts' brief reconnaissance proved that, quote, we could no longer take this direction, which was the best for getting to Monterey, where our goal lay. End all quotes. Maybe it was all starting to get to them now. It's also worth mentioning that wind and snow ceased their progress at this point for two days. That is tough on anyone. Quote, on the two previous days, a very cold wind from the south had blown fiercely without ceasing. This brought on a snowfall so heavy that not only the Sierra's heights, but even all the plains were covered with snow tonight. End quote. The last time I visited Utah, in March of 23, for my wife and I's one-year wedding anniversary, ceaseless snow and wind struck us for the entire week. 
from Moab to Boulder, Utah, and the town of Escalante to Kanab on the border of Arizona. Mountain passes were closed, rivers were too large to ford with my Tacoma, the wind made camping loud and miserable, and all the dirt and slick rock roads we had wanted to take were impassable. At one point, I pulled over near Factory Butte and Capitol Reef to take a picture and nearly got stuck in the mud. Right there, across the way, there was a service truck stuck in the mud. Only quick thinking and my exceptional driving skills saved us. Life out there on the Colorado Plateau can be brutal. And it can be made a whole lot worse when that wind ceaselessly blows and the snow creeps in. I understand the frustration and the demoralization that heavy snow and wind can cause. And I think the Padres were feeling it now. Plus, on top of just losing their guide, things must be getting pretty scary. On the 6th of October, the storm hadn't let up, and it wouldn't until around 9 that evening, after the group prayed non-stop to the saints, to the mother of Jesus, and to Jesus himself for a reprieve. Finally, their prayers were answered. But even still, they stayed put on the 7th as well. Escalante writes of this decision, quote, We were in great distress, without firewood and extremely cold, for there was so much snow and water, the ground, which was soft here, was unfit for travel. End quote. They were stuck in the impassable terrain. If you've traveled out in that area, you know what it means when roads are impassable. On that same trip with my wife, we were turned around by a massive snowstorm on the hole in the rock road in the monument named after Escalante. There was a beautiful, massive storm cascading off a 50-mile mountain that started at Highway 12 and stretched all the way down to Navajo Mountain and Lake Powell. We could see the clouds and precipitation pouring off the cliffside to the west and making its way to us as we drove through ever-increasingly larger and larger puddles, which threatened to swallow my truck. So we turned around, frustrated, but that was the theme of that trip, at least. It was a great trip, but the frustration at being turned around. After we turned around, we headed to Escalante Petrified Forest State Park. It was north of the storm, and it didn't require any four-wheel drive, So it was just about our only choice, really. And when I say impassable roads, the roads in the Colorado Plateau, if they are wet, can become dangerously slick and thick, and they can threaten to swallow a car to the axle. The roads then become a very expensive extraction at a future date when the mud hardens again. Well, thankfully, I have never experienced that, and hopefully never will. But at that Escalante Petrified Forest State Park, There's a short one-mile hike that starts at the visitor center and goes straight up a hillside where you can see many of the old Jurassic logs. Let me tell you, at the top of that hill, my wife and I's feet were so heavy from extremely thick, viscous, multicolored mud that it was tiring to walk. And the mud was ceaseless at the top as well. People passing us were barefoot. Others had given up and were sliding around carelessly. It was quite the experience. It took me quite some time to get all that mud off my hiking boots and jeans, and then I eventually just gave up anyways. And I said all of that because I totally get why they were stuck there another day. They wouldn't have made it far in that mud anyways. Little did they know, this mud and wind and snow would be the last straw. On the morning of the 8th, they woke up and got going with all intentions of reaching Monterey, but they really should have stayed until the ground had hardened because it was still, quote, so soft and miry everywhere that many pack animals and mounts, and even those that were loose, either fell down or became stuck altogether, end quote. The end was approaching. After stumbling and getting stuck and unstuck and stuck some more, they called it quits after only nine miles of heading south. They then took a reading from their inaccurate astrolabe, which put them off further south than they really were. So that was kind of disheartening news. Maybe that was the last straw. After their data collecting, they realized, even with their incorrect reading, but they realized that they were still nowhere near the coast of California. 
and they intuitively guessed correctly that in between them and Monterey were a lot of cold, snowy mountain passes. Knowing all of this, I imagine they took a good, quiet look around, saw the snow-white mountains to the west, felt the cold wind from the south that, quote, did not cease blowing all day, end quote. They took a look around and let it all sink heavily on their mind and into their clothes, and they had to have known that the going was only going to get tougher if they continued west. Plus, they were cold and without a guide and stuck in the quagmire, and they knew they only had one choice. And it no doubt was the right choice, because truthfully, they never would have made it to California in the winter. They had the endless and water-scarce Great Basin and Ranges of Nevada laid out for hundreds of miles in front of them. They still had 60 miles before they even made it to modern-day Nevada. They had all of that in front of them. And all of that sits before Death Valley and hitting the tallest mountains in the lower 48, the Sierra Nevadas. There's actually a hike to the top of Mount Whitney in the Sierra Nevadas in California, and that hike starts below sea level in Death Valley, 200 feet below sea level. And Mount Whitney, that peak sits at 14,505 feet. I'm not suggesting the D&E group would have gone that exact insane route, but no matter which way they would have gone, they would have had to have traveled, as the crow flies, over 550 miles. And that traveling would have been through so many mountains and valleys and mountains and valleys and basins and salt flats. Those valleys or basins that used to hold endless great lakes teeming with millions of birds and mastodons and giant ground sloths at their banks. Well, they would have gone through all of those dried up harsh basins and over Martian looking mountains over and over and over again until they hit the lowest point in the U.S. only to climb back up out of it to the highest point in the U.S. Continental United States. With all of that and with winter approaching, there's a good chance they would have ended up icicles or worse. They could have ended up as man corn on each other's menu. Donner party, anyone? If you're unfamiliar with that harrowing tale, here's Briggs summing it up rather nicely. The trepidation expressed in the diary forecast the strait the Donner party would find itself in when bogged down in snow short of the Sierra Nevada to our expeditions west 70 years later. It was a strait that ensued in cannibalism and starvation. The only major disaster in Anglo migration to California, it had been brought on by dallying en route and following an ill-advised itinerary. Just such blunders as afflicted our expedition. Of 79 Donner migrants, only 45, aided by rescue parties from California, survived to reach the promised land. End quote. Briggs says it's the only major disaster during Anglo migration to California. But in the next episode, I will talk about another one that maybe he hadn't thought about. The Mountain Meadows Massacre. I recently went to Owens Valley where Lone Pine, the Alabama Hills, and Mount Whitney, that very tall mountain, uh, sits. Those mountains to the east, the Inoyo are rugged and rough, and the Sierras to the west are imp- look impossible to climb and impossibly high from the valley floor, the Owens Valley floor. I could not imagine being among the 10,000-year-old volcanic rocks smoothed by a waterfall that is Fossil Falls. I couldn't imagine being there and seeing the old volcanoes around and seeing the glaciers at Mount Whitney. I could not imagine seeing all of that in the winter and then continuing on. There's just no way they would have made it. Back in the beginning of the episode, I said the delay in leaving, or I guess last episode, or no, maybe two episodes ago. But back in the beginning, I said the delay in leaving may have saved them. If they hadn't have waited 20 days or so because of Escalante's ailments, they possibly would have plunged ahead with better weather. They would have gone further west only to get stuck in this winter wonderland nightmare. 
Or they may have gone through the Great Basin in the heat and never found water. And they could have ended up like those skeletons picked clean on postcards. They may have then decided to turn around, but by then it may have been too late. And either way they went could have meant their end. Thankfully, they waited, and instead of being 20 days west, they were right to where they were supposed to be, surrounded by horrible cold and wind and fed up with the elements, and maybe even each other. Escalante writes of this, quote, Since winter had already set in most severely, for all the Sierras we managed to see in all directions were covered with snow, the weather very unsettled. We therefore feared that long before we got there the passes would be closed to us so that they would force us to stay two or three months in some Sierra where they might not be any people or the wherewithal for our necessary sustenance. For the provisions we had were very low by now, and so we could expose ourselves to perishing from hunger, if not from the cold. We also figured that, even granting that we arrived in Monterey this winter, we could not be in La Villa de Santa Fe until the month of June the following year. End quote. He then contemplated how such a delay would hurt the salvation of all the Indians they had already promised they would return back to and preach with. He figured these Timpanagotsis and Tirapangui and Utes, they all would have thought the Padres were liars or trying to deceive them and they'd leave the faith never to return, damning their souls. And that would hamper future expeditions and missionary voyages not to mention their only remaining guide, Joaquin the Laguna, the youthful Ute, might also leave them, which would mean they would be truly lost. Therefore, their only option was to, quote, continue south for as much of the terrain permitted as far as El Rio, Colorado, and from here, point our way toward Cosnina, Mokwai, and Zuni, end quote. He then writes in all caps at the end of the entry for October 8th, New itinerary and start of our return. And with that, the d and expedition had decided it was time to head home. But the trouble wasn't over yet. In fact, it had just started. Stay tuned for the next and final installment when our brave men will have their toughest challenge yet, which is finding a way across the mighty Colorado River under the imposing Vermilion Cliffs in the face of cold, hunger, lack of water despite the river being right there, and severe privations. I'll see you again in the American Southwest.